Hi, everybody. How are you, how are you all doing? Um, I love the way it's psychology of designers. I don't study the psychology of how designers are. It's psychology for designers. Anyway, before I start, do you mind, do you mind if I take a quick photo of you all? Because my mum doesn't quite believe what I do. Um, and I'm like, she's like, you're going to Amsterdam to do what? And I'm like, yeah, mum, look. Right, so can you all get in? You all in? Yeah? There we go. Good shot. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you very much. Right, okay. So, a uh, quick show of hands then. So, uh, hands up if you have... In fact, you know, we should give a round of applause so far to our organisers. Sarah, PPK, they've done a great job so far, haven't they? This is a great conference. I'm, I'm having a lovely time. So, thank you, everybody, so far. It's been great. Okay, show of hands. So, hands in the air. Have you ever bought anything on eBay before? Hands up. Have you done that before? Yeah. Have you ever bought a train ticket in the UK? Yeah. Done that before online? Yeah. Ever booked a hotel through Marriott? or maybe Ritz-Carlton, high rollers, hotels.com, people like that, okay. Ever search for princesses on Disney? A few of you in here. Right, so pretty much everybody in this room has used something that I've designed over the last sort of 14, 15 years or so. So um, I, I'm going to talk to you today about psychology. As Sarah said, my background's in neuroscience. It started with me with a book, all right, as these things always do. My mother is a psychologist. All right, just let that sink in for a second. Imagine if your mother was a psychologist as you were growing up. Anyway, for me, it was a lot of IQ tests as I was growing up. My sister's got a score two points higher than me, which is some source of resentment to this day. Anyway, for me, I didn't quite understand the psychology thing until I was about 15 years old, and I found this book on my mother's bookshelf. And I suddenly thought, yes, here we go, 15-year-old boy. Here is the manual, the secret hidden manual to, to people. All right, more specifically... I thought to teenage girls, I had a disco coming up, I thought, I'll try this book. Um, how, how do you think that went? Uh, <laughs> the perfect outlined how to read a person like a book, reading body language. Honestly, it was the hardest, most challenging thing I've ever done, is trying to look at people and talk to them and understand what they were doing. And Basically, it was an important lesson for me in terms of psychology. It taught me that anything you read in a book, when it hits the real world, it doesn't quite always work. And so today I'm going to talk to you about a lot of psychology and about how we humans are a, a funny bunch of people, how we interact weirdly, do strange things, do unusual things, have weird behavior. But I'm also going to talk to you about a framework that we can all use today to design both interactions. There's a lot of the stuff we talked about today, like buttons and search boxes, the real nuts and bolts of stuff, but also how to use psychology to design big, transformative user experiences. So how to take simple psychology of how we all think and scale that up and design fantastic products going forward. Um, I started pretty much from doing this kind of stuff, which was user research and UX about 14 years ago. I hear this quite a lot. Heard this in user research. I'm going to punch this website in the face. Heard this quite a lot. And here's specifically what I do now is I, I coach and I mentor product teams, so people like yourselves, to do the right things in the right order for the right reasons, help you manage stakeholders, help you manage users, requirements. So you're doing and building the right stuff. That's what I do these days. I wrote a book. It's good. Anybody bought my book? It's only, only $3. Right, those who bought it, did you read it? Not that I really care. A lot of people buy it because it's $3. Uh, don't feel like you have to read it. It's quite short. My favorite review of my book is it's wonderfully short. Uh, a bit like me. Uh, I've also was technical editor for three. There's a new book just come out, four books from SitePoint on user experience. These are all basically about getting you up to speed quickly on user experience uh, skills like analytics, forms, prototyping. There's one on user research. You read these in a weekend, come in on Monday morning, you can do some great work. All right, so let's talk then about psychology. So I mentioned that book earlier on that I read. I then subsequently went on and I studied neuroscience uh, a few years ago. And I also have a master's in human-computer interaction, so HCI. I did that about 14 years ago. God, I feel old now. And I'm going to talk to you a lot about what I learned on my psychology studies and all of that psychology that I've applied over the last 14 years with some of the people I just mentioned and give you some tips about how to do it and things to watch out for, which is where I'm going to start. All right, part zero. This is my one and only nod to you technical folks as I started with zero rather than one. Uh, I stopped doing HTML when uh, you, you stopped having to close Line break tags, you remember having to close line break tags inside it? That's when I stopped doing HTML, which is a long time ago. Anyway, question for you. October 2011, Dubai police noted a 20% drop in car accidents. In Abu Dhabi, it was 40%. Why? What happened 
in October 2011. Come on, cast your minds back. It was a big deal. Why did this happen, do you think? Nope, it was not women allowed to being allowed to drive. I believe I'm repeating that one back. Nothing like that. No, here is what happened in 2011. Remember BlackBerry? The BlackBerry service went out for about 48 hours. This is the start of their demise. Car accidents went down when the BlackBerry service also went down. What does that tell you about humans? Well, we all know we're stupid. That's fairly obvious. What does that tell us specifically about what we're doing in our lives? We're back. Yeah, see? Voice of Holland. What is the number one thing people are doing when they're watching Voice of Holland here in Amsterdam? Do you know what? When I ask this in the UK, people are like, having a cup of tea. <laughs> Texting. Yes. The biggest thing that people are doing when they're watching TV, something like half of all smartphone and tablet users use these devices while watching TV. Yeah, true. You must be all the same. True. You're all probably doing it now, aren't you? Stop doing that now. Concentrate on me. Yeah. <laughs> what does that tell us about the apps and the websites we're designing for our mobile devices and iPads these days? Our, have our users got 100% full attention on our apps? Of course not. Hopefully they're not driving when they're using our apps at the very least, unless you're designing app maps. But that's what's going on. Is people have not got full attention on the stuff we're designing. Okay? All those wonderful interactions you've seen today, great when you're sat here with 100% full focus on that stuff. You get, that's brilliant. But again, if you're watching the Voice of Holland, while this stuff's going on, you've not got full attention to what's going on. Really common, and I see this a lot in the user research that I do. And this is a gentleman called Clifford Nass, who's a fantastic cognitive psychologist, very, very smart chap, neuroscientist, uh, and he, he's done a lot of research on multitasking. He sadly passed away a few years ago, but he's a very entertaining man. The research is almost unanimous. It says that people who chronically multitask have an enormous range of cognitive deficits, okay? So anybody out here like to listen to podcasts while doing work? Yeah, you're a lot better. Everybody's got a lot better and knows this stuff these days. We humans think we're good at multitasking, like driving and checking our BlackBerry Messenger or watching the voice of Holland while taking out our car insurance. The reality is, is we are really bad at multitasking. We do both things worse than if we were doing them individually. All right. We think we're good at it. We're not. All right. So again, put your cell phones down, folks. <laughs> Joking. Right, so the first thing we talked about there was distraction. This is going on. People are utterly distracted when they're using our stuff all the time. All right? If we're designing our insurance sites, our banking sites, people are booking holidays, they're almost certainly doing something else whilst they're using your stuff. Other things that are going on, I'm tired, I've had a hard day. I hear this a lot when I've done, I've done a lot of work in insurance. I really find banking and money stuff really fascinating. Here's some research, user research I did on um, some insurance products. The last thing I want to do is my car insurance. Okay, Watch this piece of user research with 20 people designing stuff for Money Supermarket, which is a big insurance company in the UK. Everybody's shoulders just deflated when they heard this. But this is the actual truth of a lot of the products that we're working on. People don't want to do it. Their motivation is se severely low. When you think... What psychology can you use for motivation? Now, if any of you thought immediately uh, Maslow's hierarchy, have you come across this Maslow's hierarchy of need? Quite famous psychology. What's the problem with Maslow's hierarchy of need? It's absolute rubbish, okay? As Brad would say, bullshit. Obviously, he'd say it in a much more of an American accent, but there's no clear evidence for Maslow, okay? Back to that book that I told you at the start of this stuff. Just because you've read about it on the internet or a creative director wearing a pair of Crocs and some glasses puts this into a pitch from your agency, it does not make it true, all right? There's no evidence for this stuff. This is classic psychology bullshit. It's a myth. I've written about a few of these things as well, okay? There's probably some of you recognize. Myers-Briggs, hate the thing. Left brain to right brain, ah. Uh, Miller's number, seven plus or minus two. All of this these are psychology myths, okay? Be careful what you read about psychology. Be careful what people tell you about psychology, except me, obviously. <laughs> Not all of it is true. Here's some good stuff if you are interested in, um, in uh, motivation. This is a fantastic model by BJ Fogg, looking at how to get people to do stuff online. Brilliant. I'm not going to talk about it now. More reading for later. I used to be a school teacher, so I will check your homework. Please do read this. And again, back to this, people, motivation is extraordinarily hard for people. People wanting to do the stuff we want them to do, this seems mathematical, it's slightly not, but this formula can help you get to the root of what motivation is. Motivation is an incredible problem with, when it comes to user 
research and people using the stuff we're doing. So motivation's hard. All right, let's talk about jam, shall we? Do you have jam in Holland? Yeah. <laughs> I've obviously, that was a joke. Um, here's a, st a study that was done in the United States of America. They, did, they set up a, a, a stall in a farmer's market every Saturday. One Saturday, they sold six types of It's in the top corner, so don't forget it. Six types of jam. One Saturday. This next Saturday, 30 types of jam. Six the following Saturday, 30 the next Saturday. Which of the two experimental conditions, six or 30 types of jam, when users were offered that choice, did they sell more jam? Said, you're good. You're good. Clever people, right? Now, also, as part of this study, this is the clever bit of this study, they also undertook a survey... And they asked people, would you prefer to choose between six types of jam or 30 types of jam? Unanimously, pretty much, what did the survey come back as? Yes, yeah, see, you're smart people. What does that tell us about choice? People want choice, but they're not, they can't deal with lots of choice, all right? That's a reason to stop using surveys to get user responses, okay? People responding and talking, Steph mentioned it earlier on. Attitudinal stuff that can often come from surveys is not brilliant. People are not very good at reporting back their own behavior. Right? This study perfectly sums that one up. All right, let's talk to you about how to solve that, because I'm here to help solve problems as well. This is the best piece of psychology I've ever come across. I'll tell you why in a second. Time taken to respond versus number of options. There's a perfect linear time there, okay? The time it takes a user to choose from a choice of 30 or 6, if there's less choices, they take less time to do it, okay? Simple stuff. This is called Hick's Law. This is brilliant. Look, mathematics at the top there. Don't know what that means. Don't really care. Looks really impressive. <laughs> but that's not the best thing about Hick's Law. What's the best thing about Hick's Law when you're deciding how many things to show on a page? What's the best thing about Hick's Law if you pull that out in a meeting? It's a law. <laughs> you lay that thing down in a meeting. It's like, Hick's Law tells us to do this. People are like, okay. Choice is made. Senior stakeholders are like, all right, the law, the law. Hicks Law is a fantastic piece of psychology for helping you decide how many options to offer in choice. Less is always more. Hicks Law is a great, great, great piece of psychology. All this stuff leads up to what you've probably heard and read about is a thing called cognitive load. Okay? Too many choices, too much thinking, too much reasoning, too much deciding, too much distraction, not enough motivation, all have a massive impact on cognitive load. All of these three things dramatically have a strong impact on cognitive load. And all of this leads to this stuff, where you just get frustrated because usability or something's very difficult to use because they're not 100% focused on what you're doing, okay? It's too much choice, they're distracted, they're not motivated. It means that getting through a challenging interaction is really, really hard. So what I'm going to help you with now is I'm going to give you a little psychology framework to design better interactions. This is part one, if you've been counting. Or part two, if you, a normal computing counter, normal counter like me. Sorry, I need a drink. Okay, let's talk about this website. Do you know this website? Do you recognize this? This is Wikipedia from about 2010. It's Reese Witherspoon's birthday. That's a special reason she's uh, uh, featured on the front of the page here. That's not relevant. Don't care, I'm just telling you that. There's one, well, there's quite a few UX usability problems on this page. Here is one particular one over here. Look at this little bad boy over here. I'll, uh, look, search. Look at that. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, now, instinctively, we know this is bad, don't we? We're looking at this going, that, that's, that's bad. That's on Wikipedia, okay? So still huge millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people are using this every day and struggling with that thing there. So to, to deal with this and to figure out why, because we all know that's bad, what psychology can help us do is to, to framework and describe why it's bad. So let's talk about the points of the compass. So I'm not very good at remembering the points of the compass. Uh, north and south, that's easy, I can do that bit. That, is that right? Ah. How do you remember the points of a compass? If you're English, you'll know this one. Never eat shredded wheat. Americans say never eat soggy waffles. Is there a Dutch equivalent? No, you're just good at remembering things in Holland, aren't you? <laughs> German, any Germans in the house? Anybody German ones? French, there's a few of these. Australians talk about them. Lots of languages have what are called mnemonics to help you remember the points of a compass, okay? Never eat shredded wheat. Each step, step one reminds you of step two, reminds you of step three, reminds you of step four. 
Okay? This is a mnemonic. This is how mnemonics work. Remembering individually the names of each point of the compass, this is called declarative knowledge. Okay? It's hard. Going back to our friend Wikipedia here, whoop, wait, remembering the difference between those two buttons is declarative knowledge. What do they do? What happens if you type in Reese Witherspoon and hit go? Goes to her page. What happens if you, hit, you type in Reese Witherspoon and hit search? So it's a list of all of her pages, like Legally Blonde 1, Legally Blonde 2. Anybody know any Reese Witherspoon? You get, the, you get the point. So what this allows us to do, what declarative knowledge can help us do, is to understand and to figure out we're not very good at this stuff. Humans are not very good at remembering facts. Okay, what's the capital of Uganda? Kampala, yeah? That is declarative knowledge. That's remembering a fact. Facts are hard for us humans to do, for us to remember, which is why we create mnemonics like Never Eat Shredded Wheat to help us put a framework around what we remember, okay? So facts are difficult. Sequences, what we call procedural knowledge, is much, much easier. This is how our brain is wired. Steph talked about some of this stuff earlier. Is we build a context around how we stick, put memories together. One of the ways we do this is encoding stuff with procedural knowledge, which is a process or a flow of steps. Step one helps us remember step two, step three, step four, and so on. Each step helps us with the next step, helps us with the next step, helps us with the next step. This is procedural knowledge. This is how we humans are wired. Okay? We are good at procedural knowledge. We are bad at declarative knowledge. Except one very important group of people who are good at declarative knowledge. Which group of humans are very good at remembering facts? Computer scientists, I hear you say. Yes. So lots of us in this room are probably thinking, well, I know easy. I'm really good at facts. I can remember everything. We are slightly different to the normal part of society. Most humans, oh, that makes me sound that bad. Most of us are much better at remembering sequences of stuff, okay? We've been taught through our whole education and our jobs to remember the names of things, okay? I can't remember if it's font weight or is it text weight to put things in bold in CSS. I can't remember for the life of me. That's declarative knowledge is remembering which one of those it is, okay? Us humans are not very good at it unless we do it as part of our job. We have to remember lots of stuff. Our education teaches us memory skills, we are much better at being declarative than we are procedural. But most people find procedural knowledge much easier. Let's take an example of this in practice. Here is two slightly out of date phone unlocking systems here. We've got iPhone on the right, which you have to remember a number, and you've got Android on the your right to remember the shape. Left and right, how do you remember which ones? You know when you're screwing in a screw, how do you remember which way to turn it? Left, lefty, loosey, righty, tighty. That's another mnemonic. Remembering which way to turn a screw. Lefty, loosey, right. That's, remember that. It's really useful. This is going to stay with you. Lefty, loosey, righty, tighty. Okay, that's declarative knowledge. We're using it. We're converting it into procedural knowledge and helping us remember it as part of a mnemonic. Okay, so I went that with a pattern over here. One of these is more declarative and one of these is more procedural. iPhone, is that declarative or procedural knowledge? Having to remember a number. Declarative, very good. The shape, declarative or procedural? It's procedural. Step one helps you remember step two, step three, step four, step five, step six. Interestingly, knowing about procedural, which what's the most common passcode, uh, what's the most common shape on uh, Android? Where does it start? 95% they start in Holland and the UK. Top left, why? Reading, we're taught to read that way. And so again, understanding procedural knowledge can help us understand how this stuff is flawed and break through security, all right? We're predictable as humans, okay? The psychology of procedural knowledge teaches us how to predict what codes people will put in. What happens after a while? Yeah, this is declarative remembering the number for your screen. What happens after a while in unlocking your phone with a number, if you remember those days? You were good at it, weren't you? What does it become over time, declarative knowledge? It becomes procedural. You remember your number. What is the most common unlock code on most phones? One, two, three, four. It becomes procedural. It's us humans converting declarative knowledge into procedural knowledge because declarative knowledge is hard. As soon as we put more cognitive load on our user, we try and convert it to procedural knowledge because we are distracted, we're tired, we're not motivated. We can't be bothered to learn a complex security number, so we just convert it to procedural knowledge to make it easy for us to use it and remember it in the future, okay? That's classic procedural knowledge to help understand what went wrong here. All right, so back to Wikipedia. They, designed, they redesigned the search box. Of course they did, it's horrific. 
Let's talk about the procedural knowledge flow. What's the procedural knowledge flow of a search box? Where should it be on a classic desktop site? Come on, on this page, where should it be moved to? Top right or the top? Top right, exactly right. Instinctively, you knew that, all right? That's step one. That's where it should live, all right? Step one in procedural knowledge. Step two is what are you looking for when you're looking for a search box? A box, yeah, okay. So step two is you look for a box. What do you do when you see a box? You type into it, you can't help, you're like, you have to see, see an empty text box, you have to type something in it. We are programmed to do that, okay? That's classic procedural knowledge, all right? What's step three? We hit a button, don't we? Yeah, okay, right, big tip for you. Don't take the button out, all right? Put a button in. What happens if you remove the button? What do you break? You break the procedural knowledge. Where's the button gone? Oh, I can just press enter. Who, who just presses enter to submit a form? Apart from everybody in this room, Everybody in the real world doesn't know you can press enter to submit a form. They don't know, all right? They're taking their fingers off. They're dismissing the keyboard. They're pressing the button. They're doing this. They're taking their fingers on the trackpad and doing this. That's what they do in the real world, all right? All right, we've got two buttons here. Instinctively, which is the better one? Think about procedural knowledge. Which one's the best one? What's the, what's the problem with the magnifying glass icon? There's many. Can you be 100% sure? So think about it. Maybe a billion people use Wikipedia. Can you be sure all one billion people know what that icon means? No, you can't. Can you be sure they're able to read the word search? Probably if they're using Wikipedia, they can read. Hopefully. I'm getting into the whole world here. I'm going to step up. Right, problems with the magnifying glass. This is Microsoft Word. This is the current version of Microsoft Word for Mac. There is the problem with the magnifying glass. Right there. All right? Okay. You cannot rely on icons alone to communicate meaning. You cannot do it. Because look, they're using the icon twice within a few centimeters of each other for two different things. And it's exactly the same icon. Well, it's inverted in colors. Um, anyway, that's the problem with icons in one screenshot right there, all right? Don't use them on their own. So yeah, this is the best one. That up there, search. Empty search box, search button, that's what classically we can refer to as a design axiom. An axiom is a useful word to use to describe this stuff. It's a statement or proposition which is regarded as being established, accepted, or self-evidently true. Okay? Can you be 100% sure every single user gets this? All right? It's different from a design pattern. Design pattern is a way of doing something. Design axiom is a way you can be sure that people are going to be able to get through and do that. All right? Try and include this in your conversations when you're talking about UI elements. It'll help frame the conversations if people understand this stuff or not. All right, let's keep going. Oh, hey, uh, oh. <laughs> Hamburger menu. Is this a design axiom? Is this 100% understood by people? We wish it were, but it certainly is not. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really, really not. No, this is not the start of a procedural knowledge journey. If you're looking to change the language on a website, buy tickets for a museum, do this, that, and the other, this is not the natural place to start for doing that stuff. All right? I love the handbook. This is something I got it's quite pixelated. This picture I took of my club card piece of paper that came in the post. It's got a hamburger menu on it. <laughs> I just love that. It's on paper. I just think I love that. I loved to be in that meeting when they talked about that. Oh, I was very forward thinking, putting a hamburger. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I was lucky enough to work for the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is a uh, gig I did a couple of years ago. When we inherited and we started on the website, this is what we started with. Minimalist, okay? Art people love minimalism. Uh, they were like, we don't want too much stuff on there, but we want to sell more tickets and we want to reduce the lines of people queuing outside the moment. I was like, okay, we can help that quite quickly. What is the one thing we did to sell more tickets online and reduce the queues before people arrived? What did we get rid of? Which of these two is going to perform better? You don't need an A-B test to tell you, do you? Which one's going to perform better? Yeah, of course it is. All right? Stop hiding stuff away in hamburger menus just because it's cleaner. All right? It's not how good design works. Okay? You're confusing art and design. MoMA did. We talked about it. It's cool now. This is the place we went to. Again, we had a much bigger uplift in people going to um, exhibits and events. We had a bigger uplift in people buying stuff from the store. All of the stuff was really positive in terms of just showing what they did rather than hiding it away. All right? This stuff works better. You can hide stuff, of course, in the uh, menu. We call that stakeholder debt. So nobody finds it. Useful little uh, hack there for you. Anyway, back to Wikipedia. 
So, round of applause. Ready for this. I'm going to build some tension here. Wikipedia relaunched. They redesigned their, ser their search interface, all right? They redesigned their search interface. I can't believe I'm building tension for something that was launched like nine years ago. Whew, do you want to see what they did? Da, 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 here's what they did. Oh, it, it's better, isn't it? It's better. So on the top right, yeah, they've got rid of the go buttons. So there's no declarative knowledge remembering which one's the, which. One's which. The button, all right, we'll forgive them on the button because it's a lot better than it was before. But it is better than it was before, isn't it? I mean, come on. Yeah, it is better. All right, all right. We can be mostly clear on that. Still the same one they've got to this day, by the way. What happened to existing Wikipedia users? Did they like this change? No. Oh, there was outrage. Beautifully, the designers wrote one of these wonderful blog posts. Our creative process in redesigning the search page. And it just got just trolled to death by the Wikipedia users. Why? Why did people react this badly? Why? We broke their existing procedural knowledge flow. They were used to going to the bottom left. They were used to having the go button to get to Reese Witherspoon's page. They were used to having that choice there. They had built up a procedural knowledge flow on Wikipedia that they'd been using day in, day out. George Schultz is an editor at Wikipedia. He edits like hundreds of documents a week. He hates it because it broke his existing procedural knowledge flow. Okay. This is a useful lesson to all of you when you change things in your app, all right? Even if it's better, far better, and your user research is great and everybody loves it, your existing users will still hate it, all right? One of the biggest jobs I do, I, I act as a kind of, um, people call me when stuff goes wrong on their site. So they relaunch something and it just goes south. It goes horrible, or it's about to go south. They relaunch a big site, it goes horrible. I've worked on a couple of big high profile ones in the UK where they've relaunched and it's gone badly for a big supermarket I worked on one last year. Relaunched, it went badly. Why this? Okay, because they changed so much in one go. People had existing procedural knowledge flows of how and the last site they had before was awful. The usability of the whole online supermarket before was awful. The new one was much better. But if you're buying your groceries every week from the same grocery store, it's really, really difficult to use. Okay, when suddenly they change it, even if it's better for new people, existing people will hate it, and you'll get loads of press coverage, and it'll be awful. All right, change is difficult. People always hate change. Again, with your senior stakeholders, tell them the Wikipedia story and they'll feel better about it. Oh, a little help with that, by the way. eBay, a bit of a myth, eBay, I'm not sure if it's true or not. eBay in their early days used to have a yellow, lemony yellow background. They changed it one day for white about the same time as they got some early funding. And all the original Wiki eBay users were like, oh my God, you've taken the soul from eBay. You've gone from beautiful yellow to plain white. You've gone so corporate, we hate it. Oh eBay relented, changed it back, never changed it back. But one clever developer wrote a tiny bit of code that over the incremental period of about three months changed it. A little bit from white to yellow over the course of about three months. Did anybody notice the change? No. All right. Maybe that's a myth, maybe it's not. It's an interesting story, but it tells us what to do about change. Small incremental change over a period of time, people are accepting. Big changes, people don't like very much. Oof, how are we all doing, everybody? So I've just given you a bit of a framework there to design user, user interfaces, okay? Think about procedural knowledge flow, step one, step two, step three, step four. Design your interactions bit by bit by bit by bit. And, and by the way, don't, UI is not the place to innovate. Classic interactions like navigation, search boxes, all that stuff is not the place to run your innovations, okay? You need to get people through those interactions as quickly as possible to do the really interesting stuff on your site, okay? Basically, do what everybody else does and you'll be okay. Thank you very much. Good, no, I'm no, just, just joking. That sounds really boring and really dull, but when it comes to interactions, do that, all right? But let's talk about big stuff. Let's talk about innovation, using psychology to change the user experience at a big level, all right? Feel free to have a little sip of drink now because this stuff's going to... Cheers. I can feel my mum. I texted my mum that picture. I can feel she just texted me back. That's good to know. All right, then. So let's talk about innovation, then. and then we're going to talk to start talking about that in terms of cafes. This is a wonderful cafe in Paris. It could be, actually be any cafe in Amsterdam as well. How do you order a coffee here? What do you do? What are the steps you go through? Like, oh, meet with a friend. What are you going to do? What's the first thing you do at a cafe like this? What's the first thing you do? There's a clue. There's a big clue when you're dressed in black and white to tell you what to do. Yeah, you either ask to be seated or you go and take a seat, don't you? All right, go and take a seat. What happens next after you've taken a seat? 
What, the... what happens next? Waiter comes to you, checks the tension. She's like, what would you like, sir? Well, they bring the menu. I'd like a coffee, please. Okay. What happens next? Coffee, you wait. Coffee comes to you. Drink your coffee. Ah, oh, lovely. What happens next when you finished your coffee? And the bill, please, waiter. And the bill, waiter brings the bill to pay for the bill. They bring you change. Anyway, you basically that's it. And that's in essence that's how a cafe works here. Same in Amsterdam and Italy. The same way. You're all very familiar with using cafes like this. What's the big problem here? A lot of Americans and a lot of Brits walk away from this cafe without paying. Why? Why? Are we dishonest people. Brexit notwithstanding. Sorry. <laughs> Can't believe I even mentioned that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Edit that one out of the transcript, please. Um, it relies on this. We've all learned to drink coffee in this place, which is Starbucks, right? How do you order a coffee in Starbucks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't. I love that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's overcooked, horrible stuff. Yes, it is. All right. How do you order a, co a coffee-like drink in Starbucks? You go in. What's the first thing you do? You queue up. You don't pay, first of all. I mean... <laughs> Maybe mentally, but you, you queue up. What do you do? You order your coffee. I'm oh, my coffee, please. Then what do you do? You pay. Then what do you do? Collect, call your name. You, collect your, you go and take your coffee. You go and sit down and you drink your coffee, okay? You pay before you do it. This is your mental model, and this is how Brits and Americans have learned to order coffee. We expect to pay when we order the coffee. So when we come and, account and go to somewhere like this, our mental model is all screwed up. We used to a mental model of how a Starbucks works, and we apply it to a cafe thinking, oh, it'll be the same thing. And again, it doesn't quite work like that, all right? Which is why we expect to give our money when we brought our coffee, which is why we think we've paid and we leave. You say, oh, have we paid yet? I don't know if we paid yet. That sort of stuff happens in these kinds of places. Um, we learned, and th this is basically, this is what we, uh, in psychology is called a mental model. And we build mental models of the world around us to help us understand new and novel situations. So we'll go, oh, Coffee shop model. Go into the next coffee shop. Oh, it's a coffee shop model. I'm going to apply that same one. You can take a hotel model. You apply it to the new hotel. You take an elevator or a lift model. You apply it to the next lift or elevator you're in. We all do this stuff, okay? It's like procedural knowledge on a really large scale. We take models of the world around us in our heads. We map the situation. We apply it to new situations to reduce the cognitive load, to make things easier for us to remember, all right? Classic example of this is, have you ever moved house before? You've done that, haven't you? You ever, ever left work or school and... Absent-mindedly, before you know it, you're like mostly at your old house. Ever been in that situation? Oh, I don't live here anymore. I live. Uh. That's mental models at work, okay? Because mental models are subconscious. You're not aware of the fact you're doing it. You're thinking, oh, I'm on my way home, thinking about what you're going to have for dinner, what your boss said to you. You're not thinking about where you're going and what you're doing. Because again, subconscious thought, lower cognitive load. Mental models help us reduce cognitive load, help us to stop thinking, and help us to be able to do other things at the same time. This stuff's really powerful because it doesn't act at a conscious level. All right, let's do a digital example of one of these. Let's do a product based on this. So going away for the weekend. You've all been on holiday for the weekend. Um, okay, I've done loads of user research on this. Now let's break it down into what, how people plan holidays away really quickly. So you decide what kind of holiday you're going to do. Let's do a beach, city, ski. Oh, that's Amsterdam, I think. Spa. You all decide on what type of holiday it's going to be. Oh, I fancy a bit of culture, maybe a museum. Oh, I fancy relaxing on the beach, maybe some skiing. You decide what type of holiday you're going to, you're going to do. At one of these four. You decide when you're going to go. You think, well, maybe I'll go for a weekend in May. Yeah, that sounds good. Maybe the third or the third, first or the third weekend. Because yeah, we've got that wedding on the second weekend. Then we go, oh, let's take a long weekend. What's, what's a, a Dutch long weekend look like? What days a long weekend start here? What's that, Tuesday to Tuesday? I think you're <laughs> just joking. Yeah, Thursday to Sunday, Friday to Monday. Long weekends, there's no ISO definition of a long weekend. It doesn't, simply doesn't exist, okay? A long weekend differs depending on where you are from in the world, all that kind of stuff, okay? If you're in New York City, a long weekend starts about Saturday evening, last till Sunday morning. <laughs> You kind of get the point. They're different in different countries for different cultures, okay? So a long weekend is different, all right? Do you want to go away, uh, if it's you and your partner and you and your friend, do you want to go away in the school holiday, school vacation time? No, why not? Expensive, full of kids. I've got kids, so I understand. It's expensive. It's, you don't want to travel with kids if you don't have to. It's expensive time of year, so you want to know when holidays are. So you tend to avoid holidays if it's a weekend away, a romantic weekend away. You'll avoid holidays, school holidays for that. All right. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Where? 
What, how, when we decide to go road for the weekend, what do we say? Do we say, should we go, do you fancy going 500 miles, 500 kilometers or 800 kilometers? Oh, what's the, how do we decide in distance terms about how far to go away on holiday? Duration, do we fly, fly off, fly for two hours, three hours, drive for two hours, three hours? That's how we define distance when it comes to travel, um, comes to travel and travel companies, all right? Drive, fly, or train. This is, this is the mental model of how we book a vacation or a holiday away. Okay, pretty simple stuff, all right? You've all seen this before. You all recognize this as a conversation you've had with a partner about going away for the weekend. All right. So this is, might be the output. Let's go to the beach, fly maybe three hours on the first or the third week in May. Okay, that's a mental model, roughly, of how you want to book a holiday. Okay, this is how I want to book a holiday. In the old days, you go into a travel agent and say this. Okay? What happens when this hits the reality of modern travel websites? How, sorry if you work for Expedia, I do apologize. Uh, I have worked with Expedia before. What happens when this hits? Does this support that mental model in any, in any way? What's the problem with things like, we've got stuff like here, DD, oh, almost fell off the stage then. Oof, that would have been funny. DDMMYYY. <laughs> What's the problem with that? If you're trying to put a long weekend in, does that work? It's fixed. Do you often know what a long weekend might be? Or maybe we'll take the Monday off, maybe we'll take the Friday off, not sure. Let's see what prices come back. There's no flexibility there whatsoever about a long weekend. What about going to the beach? I mean, nothing, nothing says holiday or vacation more than city or airport, does it? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, city or airport. I can just feel the rays of sun on my face right now. No, all right? There's nothing there helping you decide where to go. There's nothing about beach holidays. There's nothing about maybe the first or the third weekend in May. It's very fixed dates. There's nothing about dis distance. How do you know three stuff that's three hours away from Amsterdam? How are you going to find that from here? You're not. All right. Interestingly, uh, they, they introduced things to do, which I loved up there. I was like, oh yeah, they've done things to do. Things to do. Oh, enter a city name or an attraction. <laughs> come on, Expedia, please, come on. There's nothing in here helping you to do this. At the top, there's nothing there that's helping you do it. So we can use mental models. When we've got a mental model like this one at the top, we can use the mental model to evaluate how our product or our competitor's product is performing. Okay? We don't care about the search buttons here. Again, from a procedural knowledge flow point of view, this is really good. If you look at the procedural knowledge flow, oh, you enter your details, duh, 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 search, off I go. Look, if I'm searching for a holiday here um, on this page, I know what I've got to do. Yeah, two adults, kids, this is great. Procedural knowledge-wise, very well put together. From a UI point of view, extremely well put together, very optimized, very well done in terms of a procedural knowledge flow. Very, you know, good, well done Expedia for that. But when it comes to something new or innovative or different in terms of what they're trying to do, it's not here. It's not matching our mental models of how we book travel in the real world. They are missing a trick. If you ever want to get involved in a travel startup, do that at the top. If you're trying to innovate your product ahead of your competitors, find the mental model and design to that. So you can evaluate immediately how well your competitors are doing. Oh yeah, or are your own product is doing. Oh yeah, we're evaluating it, great. From a procedural knowledge point of view, it's fantastic. From a mental model point of view, however, our experience could be a lot better than it is. So mental models are evaluative. Okay, you can take them, but you can also generate new ideas from it. All right, any ideas? How would you design a travel website to help you choose stuff that's three hours away from you in Amsterdam? What would you, what, what would you put in the UI layer on the front of the page? A map, a map showing what? Cir concentric circles with hours away from where you are. Oh, I put in Amsterdam, I see concentric circles of two hours drive, three hours drive, four hours drive, the same with flights. Suddenly, you've got a huge world of choice about where you can go. You're helping people understand how to book stuff. You're getting to them earlier in their decision-making process, unlike Expedia, who are right there at the end when you've made all the decisions. If you, as your innovative product, can get there earlier in that life cycle, you're going to get them before Expedia gets them. Expedia are not helping you unless you know exactly what you want. Your product can do that sort of stuff. Mental models can help you generate new, innovative ideas. Use them. They're great. Whew. How are we all doing, folks? All right, then. So I've, co I've just talked to you then about two very different uses of psychology. User experience, 
um, through mental models to really truly transform and send your product into new and innovative spaces. We've talked about procedural knowledge flows as ways of redesigning and redefining your user interface, the steps you go through to do a very, very basic interaction. Okay? We've talked about how to innovate and how to get people through a really challenging and difficult interaction up front. Psychology can really help you as designers and product managers to define exactly what's going on. So if you take one thing away from today, uh, no, never eat shredded wheat, it's the thing to take away from today. Just joking, don't take that, just that away from today. Think about it in these terms. So a designer, a product manager, a developer who doesn't understand psychology is going to be no more successful than an architect who doesn't understand physics. This building, beautiful, but it will never work. The same is true if your products, unless you understand how humans think, behave, view the world, build models of the world, your product is not going to be successful. I mean, you could hire me, that would help. But in this world, you've got to understand how psychology works to really, truly understand how your users work to get this through this stuff in the future. This fits into a tweet picture as well, if you want to take it with me in it. Come on. <laughs> this is my social media strategy right here. Take it if you want. Anyway, um, stay in touch, everybody. Um, these are my details. Drop me a line. My slides, a video of this talk is at that address there. Find me on Twitter. Drop me an email if you've got any questions about this. Do you want to work with me on stuff? My website's got loads of resources on all of this stuff. And my book's pretty good, too. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. Thank you, Joe. So Hi. first of all, that was amazing. Oh, thanks, Sarah. I'm very much into practical kind of stuff. And I really loved how you showed the problem with the website. And then you combined it with all of the psychology concepts that you were talking about. And then we were able to literally solve the problem by combining those two things together. So do you, like, what do you recommend, or us as designers or, or as developers, if we want to learn more about this kind of stuff? Um, more specifically, combining the practical with the psychological, um, where, where can we learn all about that? It's a good book out there, and no, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> the thing to do, the, the, so a lot of it seems quite obvious when I'm putting together and talking about it like here. The thing to do is to do your user research and to watch out for and look for procedural knowledge in terms of the way people in, approach interactions. If they're doing something on your website, watch how they use it. Put together a procedural knowledge flow based on user experience. If you've got tools like Hotjar or Treejack or stuff that records user sessions, watch the user sessions to understand the procedural knowledge flow that people are trying to use through your site. Try and understand what's going on through user research and any screen recordings you've got of your users using your site. You can see where your procedural knowledge is probably breaking down. The user research can help you find what the procedural knowledge should be for each of the interactions you're looking at. When it comes to mental models, though, the best kind of research is uh, out in the wild, so going into people's homes, into people's workplaces. So the stuff I showed you there around... Um, the mental model of booking a holiday, I did that by going into people's homes and sitting with them while they book a holiday, listening in the conversations that they have as families about booking a holiday away, noting down all the conversations they have outside of any interactions or any products. As Steph talked about earlier on, a wider context of what people are going and understanding will help you define and understand what that mental model is and give you those clues as to how to innovate and jump ahead of your competition. Okay, but... well. Uh, as a freelancer, I've gotten to work with a few clients, and sometimes those clients, they don't, um, they don't prioritize the budget or the time to do that kind of user research. So what, what, what can we do in that case? I mean, I think Jared, Jared talks about this really well, actually. I mean, the thing to talk about is not the user research itself, but the outcomes you're going to get from doing it. So if you talk about that mental model, it's about attaching either a KPI or a monetary value to the work that you're going to do. So a lot of organizations will want to talk about being innovative, and you say, great, let's be innovative. We can look at boosting our bottom line by this amount of money or increase these KPIs by doing this work. So talking about it in terms of the structure of the business that you're trying to work with, rather than saying we want to do user research, which is expensive and time consuming, mm -hmm. you base it around the results you're going to get off the back of it. And you justify it based on the results to the final product rather than the task you've got to do to get there. Okay, so just a quick question regarding icons. You said n not to use icons on their own, yeah. and um, I completely agree with that, but sometimes we absolutely need to. So there's this, um, this idea of progressive reduction. What mm -hmm. do you think about it? So you start with the icon and the text, and then yeah. can we, is it safe to assume that the user is going to learn the meaning of those icons with time, and then it will be, sa be safe for us to remove the words? Or? Possibly, but possibly not. If, if we're removing the words ourselves, it shouldn't be our choice to do it. So again, I still struggle with the screwdriver to remember which way is left and right. 
And I've been using and un unscrewing things for many years. Could have misquoted me on that one. <laughs> but <laughs> I believe I just said that. I'm sorry. Right, anyway, but the problem being is that I'm, I don't know if I'm ever going to get that right. So us as designers saying after an arbitrary month, three months, we're going to, in the UI, remove those icons themselves. That should be the user's choice to do that stuff. Yeah, yes, absolutely do it, but don't expect us to be able to take the users on that journey on their behalf. That's an excellent idea, because the only time that I saw anyone talk about progressive reduction, it was the designer's decision to make the reduction, not the user's. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for the insights. No, thank, thank you very you. much, Cheers. Sarah. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>